Carol's Daughter Productions presents St. Jane and the Wicked Wicks. Written, composed, and produced by Kristen Lems. Directed by Douglas Post. Don't have many memories I want to bring back I've made quite a mess of my life I remember each baby I held in my arms Even if it was only one night But my grandmother's garden it beckoned to me Taken back to Chicago when my grandmother died. Though she loved me, she had not changed her will. In a tenement slum, beaten till I was numb, sent to work at eleven. start when you die it's here and it's now and i just don't know how to escape jesus knows how i try just one bright memory can comfort me now from the time when my life had a plan an apron full of flowers in the garden for hours picked with I'm Nellie Wicks, and that's my song. It's about my struggles and my sorrows, but also some joys, mostly because I found Hull House by accident and met a precious friend, Jane Adams, when I was 12 years old. Who could that be? Ellen, could you pull aside the curtain and see who it is? Oh, Jane, there's a girl standing at the door, alone. 10.30? What could she want? We are probably the only ones with lamps burning at this hour. Just like our seminary days, Ellen. <laughs> yes, young lady? Come in. Thank you, ma'am. I saw your light. It's my mother. Her time has come. She's having a baby, and he is beating her. He's got the snakes. Who's that? My pa. He's out of his head from drink. Can you send some men over to stop him? Here, dear, put on this shawl. March nights in Chicago are cold. Thank you, ma'am. You say your father is beating your mother? Where are they? Across the street. We're above the candy store, 801 Holstead. And your mother is in labor. Is anyone... What did you say your name was, dear? I'm Nellie. Nellie Wicks. Nellie, is anyone with your mother now? Just Pa. My brothers are out picking up wood. Pa was kicking and punching her, and he started after me. Can you get your brothers to stop him? 
They might be anywhere. Besides, George, he's a bookworm, and he's no good for fighting. And Jean's too short to put up fists against that raging beast. Then we must call the police. <laughs> Last time they came, he popped the buttons off a copper's coat. They couldn't get back in the paddy wagon fast enough. Oh, dear. If your mother is giving birth, we must also fetch a doctor. He doesn't like doctors, either. But we are not ready to deliver a baby. Nellie, here, take this money, find a cab, and tell him to bring a doctor from Lying In Hospital. This is a dollar. Yes, it will cover two trips, to go to Lying In and find the doctor and bring the doctor back here, and it's late at night. Oh, thank you, Miss... Miss, uh... I'm Jane Adams. And I'm Ellen Starr, Nellie. Thank you, Miss Adams, and Miss Starr. How are we going to hold back a raging beast and deliver a baby at the same time? Julia! I heard the commotion from the library. A raging beast? A baby? I almost forgot you were working here. You work too hard, Julia. You would certainly know about that. We have a spinning wheel demonstration in the morning. Our volunteers need instructions. To the point, Julia, a girl from across the street came begging for help. Her father is beating her mother, who is in labor. Jane sent her to find a cab to get a doctor. Have you called the police? I'll go and do that now. I called them only yesterday about a fracas on Blue Island. Imagine two grown men throwing fists over a wheelbarrow. How often the poor seem greedy when they're only needy. How did it end up? I found the men a second wheelbarrow, and it was resolved before they even arrived. I had to convince them not to arrest the men, who desperately needed it to move some bricks, and neither spoke the other's language. Good diplomacy. But, Julia, what will we do if this woman has the baby before the doctor arrives? We'll simply yank the baby out, cut the cord, and give it a few slaps. Farm women deliver babies every day in Cedarville. But we're not farm women. We can do it. Don't you know that common sense can rise to the occasion? We can do it. Can we do it? Often being well prepared can be the best persuasion. We can do it. Can we do it? Gather scissors, soap and towel, some iodine and rags. Don't forget the basin, pack them quickly in these bags. We can do it. We will do it. The police are familiar with 801 Halstead and are coming with a paddy wagon and four officers. They asked if it concerned a wheelbarrow. Ha! <laughs> I called them about those bricklayers I told you about. We worked it out before they got there. But that was yesterday. Yes, this is a new day, or rather new night. Jane, we're gathering supplies in case we need to be midwives. Oh, good idea. For all we know, the room might be completely empty. Where's the girl? Hmm. She's supposed to be sending the cab. Let me check outside. Could the girl's father be that awful red-faced man? The one who swaggers down the middle of Halstead, swinging his axe as the children scatter in terror? Must be the one. How will we manage him until the police arrive? Maybe Jane will know a way. She could talk an arrow back into its quiver. It just makes me quiver. At least there are three of us. And the girl. Nellie didn't know how to get a cab. I flagged one and sent it to the hospital. She's waiting for us by their stairs. Let's go. Couldn't we wait for the police? Every minute counts. When life offers danger, we must meet it with courage. Can courage ward off a raging beast? Certainly. Courage and stern words. But how can we protect ourselves? How about wielding these umbrellas? We can serve our neighborhood with courage and with passion. We can do it. 
we can do it. Elevate the culture and make social work a fashion. We can do it. We can do it. Let's push up our sleeves and we'll somehow find a way. Brandish our umbrellas holding obstacles at bay. We can do it. We will do it. We can do it. We will do it. Three Musketeers. On guard, Umbrella Warriors. A la guerre. Thank you for letting me rest here, Miss Adams. I'm about fit to collapse. It was a long night, but a happy outcome, wasn't it, Nellie? A sweet little brother. Yes, Miss Adams. You and the brave lady saved the day. For all his violent bluster, your father couldn't get past our umbrellas. <laughs> he called them bats, and you chased him away without the cops. Yes, he was long gone by the time they arrived. But since the doctor is still there, I can give you a little rest here. Your room is so peaceful and pretty. And this pretty blue dressing gown? My Graham used to have one like this. A little big for you, but it will do in a pinch. And the warm milk? <sighs> Thank you, Miss Adams. I'm sorry Ma said those awful things to you. Oh, no need to explain. Women say many things when they are in labor. Ma's always like that. That's why Graham took me to Rochester as a baby, to escape this hell on earth, as she called it. That is, until the day that ended all my happiness, September 18th, 1888. September 18th? That day, Graham fell down the opera house steps. She died a week later. Oddly, Nellie, September 18th is a memorable day for me, too, but a happy one. Exactly one year later, September 18th, 1889, was the day we opened Hull House. What house? Of course. How would you know? Hull House. This building, this settlement. Miss Starr and I purchased the house, and we live here. Miss Lathrop, the umbrella lady, will be moving in soon, joining several others. We've settled here to offer service to this neighborhood, to neighbors just like you. I see ladies that look like my gram coming in and out, but I don't know what it's about. What do you do? Hull House is a settlement house. We offer classes and clubs, a public kitchen, meeting rooms, English classes for immigrants, book binding, hot showers. Your mother could bring little Walter here on a Saturday morning when the Italian mothers come to wash their babies. Hot showers? Could I take a shower? Ma only allows me one sponge bath a week. Yes, of course. Poor child. How did you end up back in Chicago? When Graham was dying, my ma suddenly showed up at her bedside, her very first visit. I didn't even know who she was. She thought she'd get an inheritance, but Graham had taken her out of the will years before, after Ma ran away with a carny. Carney? A carnival roustabout? Yes. Pa put up carnival rides before he became a latherer. Instead of an inheritance, Ma ended up with another mouth to feed. Me. Didn't your grandmother's will provide for you, dear? Even though she told me she was going to include me in her will, she died before she finished changing it. So instead of becoming a proper lady, I got sent back to hell on earth. Say, Miss Adams, is that a clothesline above your bed? I see scraps of paper hanging from it, instead of clothes. Yes, it is. When I get ideas, and I get them a lot, Nellie, I jot them down and pin them up there until I have a chance to think more about them. A paper clothesline? That's funny. <laughs> Can I take one down? Of course. Can I read it? Of course, Nellie. It says... I seek to live in a really living world and refuse to be content with a shadowy reflection of it. How does that sound to you? I like it. Graham and I used to talk like that a lot. She was teaching me how to live in fine society. But I never talk about those things no more. I mean, any more. You see, Miss Adams...
forgetting how to talk. My gram said I spoke like an angel. I had pretty things to say that nobody would mock, but now I've gone straight to hell in Chicago. You don't need lots of words to get yourself across. Fancy talk won't get you very far. You gotta learn to cuss or even throw a punch if you walk home from work past a bar. I am forgetting how to walk. Toes pointed straight, a book on my head. A couple of years more, I could have made the ladies balk. But now I've gone straight to hell in Chicago. Can't walk like a lady in an alley full of rats or when the bottom of my shoe falls apart. If Graham is looking down, I'm sure she's got a frown. I kick in with my skirts up like a tart. Bravo, Nellie. What wonderful singing and dancing. If it was up to me, I'd sing and dance every day. At my school in Rochester, I even starred in some plays. The seminary could have learned a thing or two from your school, I think. The what? Rockford Female Seminary, where I was sent to school. Except for hymns, singing was strictly forbidden, and dancing was unheard of. That's a silly rule. Singing and dancing is what we girls love best. Why, I could teach you to dance in no time. Oh, my. I'll show you. Stand up. My lady, please join me in the shottish. Oh, do you see me dance the shottish? Do you see my petticoats fly. Do ya see me dance the shoddish? Do ya see my petticoats fly? We'll dance the shoddish in the hall. We'll dance the shoddish one and all. Put your left foot back and your right foot in. Spin me, lady. Spin, spin, spin. Nellie, don't spin me quite so fast. I'm not accustomed to dancing in my dressing gown. Or at one in the morning, for that matter. You're doing fine, Miss Adams. Let's try another round. Come on in, the door is open. Welcome to whole house, neighbors and kin. Whatever you need, whatever you're hoping, Miss Jane Adams will welcome you in. We'll dance the shoddish in the hall. At the whole house settlement, one and all. Put your left foot back and your right foot in. <laughs> Thank you for the dance, Lady Jane. It was my pleasure, Miss Nellie. The dance and your new words. Hull House is worth singing about. I wonder if Ellen would like to learn the shoddish. Oh, but she prefers the classics. Maybe Mary Smith, the new volunteer. She seems to warm to music. I can teach you the country dances and the dance hall dances, too. And I know high kicking and the split. So many talents at only 12 years of age. I'm sure your grandmother was charmed. Not really. She always said, whistling girls and crowing hens always come to some bad end. <laughs> she thought I was too high-spirited, which I am. I'm high-spirited by nature too, Nellie. Promise you won't tell. Miss Adams, your secrets are safe with me. At the seminary, one of the girls got hold of a dangerous substance, opium. We crushed the pills and ate them, just for the fun of it. It made us quite sick. We had to have our stomachs pumped. Oh! 
And once I challenged a teacher for a very valid reason, I might add, and our whole class was suspended for three days. <laughs> you were a mischief maker. And I discribbled a defiant poem in my friend's hymn book. <clears throat> Life's a burden, bear it. Life's a duty, dare it. Life's a thorn crown, wear it, and spurn to be a coward. Say it again. I like it. Life's a burden, bear it. Life's a duty, dare, dare it. it. Life's a thorn crown. Wear it, it and, and spurn to, to be, be a, a coward. I don't want to wear a thorn crown, though. Neither do I. That was how I understood life at the time. Now I know that the thorn crown is poverty and abuse. You can say that again. Did you get beat for your disobedience? My father never laid a hand on me. My sisters thought he spoiled me. But my stepmother always disapproved of me. In fact, she still does. Isn't she proud of what you're doing at Hull House? Nellie, she has not visited once since we opened five months ago. She thinks what I'm doing is not respectable enough. Respectable is as respectable does, I always say. I like your candor, Nellie. I spend far too much time with the respectable class. They are so polite that half the time I can't figure out what they really mean. No one's polite where I work, or respectable either, for that matter. Work, Nellie? Where is that? Central Steam Laundry. Twelve hours a day, six days a week, for a grand total of two dollars a week. Twelve years old. Twelve hours a day. Two dollars a week. Outrageous. Nellie, you were cast into the churning sea and Providence brought you to the shores of Hull House. I will be your protector from now on. Maybe there are angels on earth, friends to the friendless. Can I call you Aunt Jane? Yes, Nellie. We'll be like family. Now get in that little cot. Sleep well, and I'll wake you in time to get to work. Just think, you have a new little brother. And you have learned to dance the shottish, Aunt Jane. Where's that damn food? I told her I'd want food. Food! Not a bowl of runny soup. Make way. Hot old. brass coming. Stand clear while I shake off my overalls. George, just because you work in a brass foundry don't give you the right to shed bits of brass all over. You shake yourself off good before you come in here. The landlord don't want no bits of metal laying around. You know I shake them off every night, Mother dear, and I will do it tonight. There. Clean as a whistle. We don't want no eviction. Two evictions is enough. I believe there have been three, Mother. Perhaps you might have a word with our father about that. Landlords do not enjoy seeing their rooms destroyed or furniture hurled out the windows. They don't like their properties visited by police called by frightened neighbors. And they don't like bloodstains on the floor. He don't do all that. At least not lately. Now let me eat. Uh, Brother Jean, what fine vittles is our mother currently enjoying? Or, put in the vernacular, what's for dinner? <laughs> I am famished. Ah, curse this family. Wasted old dish rag. Hear ye, hear ye. Behold today's fine slum gullion meal, fit for King Lear himself. Strap on your feed bag, Master George. Mmm, 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 an aromatic bouquet. You are a cordon bleu, Chef Eugene. Giuseppe had some extra onions at work and passed them around. I got three. And where, may I ask, is our lovely sister Nellie? Little Walter? Walter's down for the night, and Nell got extra hours again. And we got an extra mouth to feed tonight.
Beelzebub, or should I say our father, showed up about an hour ago, polluted as usual. Hmm, I thought I heard a familiar voice ranting and raving in the alley. So, he's back from his three-week grand tour of Chicago's finest watering holes. I'm a hungry man, damn it. Give me some real food. Such talk. Gene, save plenty for your pot. He's expecting a big bowl. Mmm. Your best slum gully in ever, Gene. All the more so considering it was concocted by a lad of only 13 years old who spent the day dangling from scaffolds wielding a squeegee. You are a brother of many talents. Takes one to know one, I'd say. Lazy. Good for nothing. I swing my axe all day. Uh, rehearsing his vast repertoire of curses, I discern. Here's a napkin, Mother. Walter's gonna call you Ma. And with all your cooking and cleaning, I should farm you out to cook when you're not washing windows, Jane. Maybe the high and mighty Jane Adams would hire you. The maiden ladies can't cook worth a damn. Mother, since Nellie met her two years ago, Miss Adams and the other maiden ladies have given us many precious books, including the complete plays of William Shakespeare, my source for tonight's study of the plight of young Edgar, cast adrift as Tom O'Bedlam in the tragedy of King Lear. You will remember Nellie's outstanding performance earlier in the week? I don't know how something like you came out of someone like me. But as long as you bring home your pay, I don't give a fiddler's fart. Go and be a highbrow with your plays, your ching-chong Japanese, your crazy quo virus. Food now. The rats are running around inside my head and need a nip of fresh meat. Finish up, Ma. There's plenty left for Pa. Come in, Jim! And to think ladies not half so pretty as me make ten times more just by opening their legs. And here I'm playing maid servants to a drunk. Wife, May tells me that she can make a couple of dollars in an afternoon and she's not even pretty. Must we hear this? Your children. Oh, and let's not forget Mr. Professor. What a disgrace. Instead of building a oh, mother, when will you untether yourself from that lower life form for all our sakes? I had the pick of the class. Turned heads. Still do, I might add. But what do I have to show for it? A 15-year-old tart always whining about her job. A highfalutin oddball who would grab a book over a beer. A bleeding heart window washer who cooks and cleans like a girl. And that tiresome two-year-old. It's a wonder I look as good as I do. Ah, oh, dear mother, your slings and arrows will not hurt us. We shall survive and thrive. There's a big, brilliant world out there. And what a joy it is to explore it. Here is the bowl, dear Jean, with my heartfelt thanks for your cuisine. <laughs> and now I rejoin young Edgar and bid you all farewell. What falderaw? Look at that. Hands clapped over his ears, bent over the damn book. He don't even know where he is now. Once George hunkers down to read, he could miss a gas explosion. Bring me food, damn it! Your pa worked up an appetite making a boot rack from them boards you and George found. A boot rack? All we're missing is the boots. Here, ma. Here's Pa's bowl. Oh, what's this? This bowl wouldn't feed a sparrow. Your dad is a big man, not a pit squeak like you. Honor your father like the good book says. For Pa, good book means it's a good book to throw at your kids. Enough insolence. Fill the bowl to the top. Here you go. Now, something for Big Jim to wash it down. Take, take down the whiskey behind and pour him a glass. Here. Now, the snakes and rats are waiting to run up your skirts and tickle you. I command you to come. It's your wife, Big Jim. Hold on. Here I come. If Walter stirs, you take that bottle, soak a cotton ball, not too much, mind you, and lay it under his nose like I showed you. You hear? Here I come, Big Jim. 
Jeez. Ever heard of holding your baby, lady? King Ratbrain sloshes around like a pig in a sty, and you always manage to watch over him. But do you ever remember your four kids? Hey, Nelly! Good thing you came in through the front door. I don't like the alley this late. Why? Don't tell me Pa's here. Yep, out back banging around. He stumbled in about an hour ago, polluted as usual. Shouting for me, I suppose? I told him you were working late, but he won't remember. Walter asleep? Down for the night. Too bad us big kids can't get a good night's rest. And there's our dear scholar, hunched over his book, far away from here, at the Globe Theater. Too bad we ain't got no education in our line, or George would be a professor. They say he recites poetry at the factory. Oh, Jean, I can't even lift my arms from folding sheets. All for this. One stinking nickel. Not even enough to buy a pickle. And speaking of pickles... Here's your bowl, sis. I had to set it aside before the hungry hyenas got it. I could eat a horse. Sorry, no horse meat. No meat at all. In fact, just some potatoes, beans, cabbage, horseradish, and onions. A three-onion slum gullion special. You're a weak-livered bunch of ingrates. Hey, maybe we'll get lucky tonight and he'll pass out. And never wake up. Mm, this is delicious, Jean. After 14 hours standing up with nothing but tea and sugar, dry bread, and a couple of radishes, it's hard to say what'll get me first, dropping dead from hunger or getting beat to death by Pa. <laughs> Think George will let me play Cordelia again, or has he moved on to a new play? No, he's still leering. <laughs> <laughs> So, did Ma clean at that new gentleman's hotel again today? You mean the one that ain't seen a gentleman yet? Yep. The Friendship Hotel for Single Men. Scrubbing floors ain't the main activity, that's for sure. And that other scrub woman, May, is putting ideas in Ma's head. It figures. Did she leave Walter with the D'Angelo's again? Yep. Kid's gonna sing opera and play the accordion before he speaks a word of English. I gave them some potatoes and onions when I picked him up. Prego and grazie. The two magic words. I want food. Real food. Not a, a bowl of runny soup delivered by an old hag. A working man needs something to sink his teeth into. This ain't enough to fill the belly of a bird. I take it Ma's out back, too? Yep. Pour and more demon drink into his pie hole. Demon is the word. The slum is running, you bloody bitch. And where's Nell? I want Nell, not you, hag. You know that. I want to look at her. <laughs> the rats in my head like to tickle her. Where are those nails? I'll get them, Jim. Just hold on. Ah, you've been enough trouble, you washed up scrub woman. I told you to bring the girl. The rats up here in my brain are running around looking for her. Boys, here comes your father. At attention. Quick, Nell, get under the bed and take your bowl. Oh, God, Jean, don't let him know I'm here. Give me some real food, weakling. And where are the nails? Where's Nell? She's working late, Pa. Let's get your dad another bowl, Jamie. Uh, fill up a bowl for your father. Pasty face. You can't cook worth a damn. I swing my axe all day. I come home expecting a tuck in and get nothing but a watery bowl of slosh. Sorry, Pa. Well, if it ain't Mr. Professor slumping in his chair. Hand me down those nails, boy, you hear? I'll get them, Pa. Just put down the hammer, and I'll get them for you. Answer me when I speak, book boy. Too busy to help your pa? Go faced misfit, read this hammer, ah! then. Ah! 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 
Ah, you good for nothing. How about you read my kicks? Oh, Jesus. His head. George is bleeding out of his head. Shut up. No one passes through this door, you hear? No doctors, no police, no do-gooders, no neighbors. I'm going down to the corner, and when I get back, we'll have a session with the straps, slum boy. And I'm looking for the girl to, you tell her that I aim to see her, or else. <laughs> oh God, Jordan. What has he done to you? Oh, George! George! Oh, look at the blood! Oh, God! He's unconscious! So you're hiding <laughs> under the bed, Nellie? Hiding away when your dad calls for you? Well, you can hide, but you can't escape! Ma, look at George! And where's that nickel? Here's your nickel. George needs to go to the hospital. You two stay put. No one's coming in here, and he ain't going nowhere. Get some rags and sit him up. See what happens when you read too much? Alan, Julia, look at today's mail. It's enough to fill a laundry basket. It seems there's more mail every day. It must be because the fair is only six months away. Yes, there are more requests for tours every day. Everyone seems to think Hull House is second in importance only to the Columbian Exposition. 400 years for Columbus and four years for Hull House. Just a couple of zeros difference. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your mail, Ellen. Let's see. St. Vincent's, the Civic Federation, a solicitation to wash our windows. Which reminds me, Nellie's brother came by yesterday. You know, the window washer? Jean, did you get their new address? Yes, I put it on the desk. Here. They're living in a rooming house over on Sangamon now. That drafty hovel on Jefferson didn't last long. Nor the one on Halstead. Isn't this their third eviction? Didn't the third one only last six months or so? Yes. Wicks threw what little furniture they possessed right out the window and just missed a passerby. Then he disappeared again, leaving the family to move everything overnight. They always hope he won't find them, but he always does. Nellie warned us not to come by any more. As besotted as his mind is, he still remembers the night we chased him off with our umbrellas. He has vowed revenge. The night we nearly delivered a baby. We were ready. But poor Nellie, he takes his wrath out on her. Like he did to the oldest boy. Oh, poor George. Imagine what he might have become. From a prodigy to a prisoner in just a few months. And to think George was never seen by a doctor. It's no wonder the damage was irreversible, not only to his intellect, but to his moral sense. Another child of promise gone. How does that evil man get away with it? Unfortunately, their mother turns a blind eye. She even encourages it. When the beatings are spread around, she doesn't get quite as many. Well, now that we have the new address, why don't I send Mary over with a letter inviting Nellie to do some mending for us? Why Mary Smith? Well, Wicks won't recognize her. Besides, she's so helpful. What would we do without her? I, for one, would do exactly the same thing I'm doing right now. But if Mary's the one you think can get to Nellie, by all means, let's send her. Jane, any more mail? How about the letter I'm expecting? Let's see. Bills. We can always count on them. Flyers, invitations. Ah, here's what you've been waiting for, Julia. An embossed envelope from the governor's office. So that's why the invitation took so many weeks. It needed embossing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
How nice. The oh-so-distinguished gentlemen have finally invited me to sit on the Illinois State Board of Charities, one year after I drafted the charter which created it. They always manage to forget about the women, don't they? Will you have a vote? Let me see. Ah, ex officio. I guess not. A vote? Of course not. We're much too pure to get down in the mud with the men and vote. I'd have reminded us that even the Negro men who won the vote don't really have it. Oh, poll taxes, literacy tests, not to mention lynchings, all thrown in their path. We must fight for their rights and for ours by all means at our disposal. We must have the franchise. Let's be frank, the fairer sex has not been treated fairly. We can do it. Time to do it. Women working in the sweatshops just surviving barely. Time to do it. We can do it. Women of all backgrounds are stuck in the same boat. Pounded by the tempest with no oars and, and with, with no vote. vote. We, we can do it. We can do it. We will do it. We will do it. We will turn this world around with purpose and with passion. We can do it. We can do it. Tell our stories loudly until voting is a fashion. We can do it. We can do it. With determination, we will always find a way. We will live to see the vote. We'll have it one fine day. We can do it. We will do it. We can do it. We will do it. Well, at least we're getting a voice. Until then, we must continue to steer the ship. While men declare themselves captain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now let me write that invitation to Nellie. Welcome to Hull House, Richard. I'm flattered that you could stop by, since I know every minute these days must be busy for the famous Richard Crane, builder of so many important structures at the fair. Jane, what you have built here at Hull House is just as big an attraction as my plumbing at the fair. I suppose we both enjoy building things. It's good you're here at this time of the morning, so you can see daily events getting underway. We are overflowing with staff, volunteers, residents, neighbors, and visitors from around the world. Most impressive, Jane. Hello there. Come on in, the door is open. Dance into the whole house rag. Where two dozen languages are spoken. Dance into the whole house don't need a job or any money Or even a mother or dad We'll, we'll just teach you the steps And, and then you do the rest And you'll be dancing to the whole house rag Maybe you'd like to try drawing Dancing to the whole house rag You can learn hammering and sawing Dancing to the whole house rag there's tree work and sugars in the basement. That's something that I can use bad. So whatever ails you, we'll never fail you. Come, Come and do, do the whole house rag. Could you show me where I can find the whole house book binder? Behind the children's day nursery I came for the choir I came cause my mother's working till ten One and all come on in Do you have the time? All the necktie workers 
Tigers will be coming soon. I ain't got a dime, and I hear they serve a hot lunch at noon. Ain't seen nothing yet. Circus acrobats and bricklayers too. Come, Come and do, do the whole house land. Wealthy ladies having nothing to do. Come, Come and do, do the whole house land. Pottery classes and a drama club too. We've got something that everyone needs. Weather parties or Shakespeare. You've got a place here. Come, Come and do the whole house rag. Come on in, the door is open. Dance into the whole house rag. Where two dozen languages are spoken. Dance into the whole house rag. You don't need a job or any money. Or even a money. Well, Jane, I certainly did come at the right time. What a wonderful display of enthusiasm! It seems Hull House has Columbian exposition fever. The past three months have been a whirlwind. Now, Richard, let us see if we can't find a spot for your wife and her sister in today's tour. The morning tour will begin at 11. Until then, please wait out on the street. Evelyn, you are outdoing yourself, handling all these tourists. I'm glad to help, Miss Adams. They come for the fair, but they won't leave town without seeing Hull House. Evelyn, this is my friend Richard Crane, who has helped build some of the marvels at the fair. His sister-in-law has just arrived from Ohio, and I hoped we might be able to reserve two places for the tour today for his wife and her sister. Welcome, Mr. Crane. We have an afternoon tour at three. Would that be acceptable? We'll have a delegation of 11 from England, but if your wife and her sister don't mind a little congestion, we can certainly add them to the group. We would be most grateful. I'll put them on the reservation list. Mrs. Crane, two guests. Please have them check in at 2.45. I shall do that. Now, please line up. Jane, what I like most about Hull House is the industrial training you offer. Uh, masonry, carpentry, and the like. But the bookmaking, the art appreciation, the, the philosophy classes and such are better left to society ladies, not the immigrant class. Richard, how shall we harness the energy of America's new residents if not through the arts and education? Depends on what kind of education, Jane. Is it practical, or is it just sowing discontent? Hull House should certainly not be organizing necktie workers. Don't hard-working men and women deserve to better their wretched living conditions? But <clears throat> forward-thinking employers such as myself provide the best industrial conditions. We have a physician on staff, pensions, promotions, as you know very well. But a union? Never. Echoes of Haymarket. Of course, Richard. But not all employers are as enlightened as you. My dear wife thinks you walk on water, so I bow to her superior wisdom. But to the point, I also wanted to confirm your visit to our exhibit area at the fair next Thursday morning. I have told several industrial leaders that you would be stopping by. They may be interested in providing support to Hull House. Thank you, Richard. I'll be glad to share a few thoughts with them. As you know, I'll be speaking on a panel later that day, but I should have plenty of time to get to the women's building. Did you say ten o'clock? Yes, that's right. A, a pity about that woman's building, isn't it? Such an unsightly mess for our distinguished visitors. It's one of the few places on the fairgrounds that working families can sit and eat their lunches. Perhaps the area simply needs more trash receptacles. 
<laughs> you want to reform garbage collection too now, Jane? Chicago has modern water fountains. Why not modern garbage collection? Ah, oh, Jane, you never leave well enough alone. Hello, Aunt Miss Adams. Here is the wash and the mending. Hello, Nellie. Just put the basket down by the door for now. Nellie, I'd like you to meet my friend Mr. Crane, who has developed some of the indoor plumbing for the fair. Glad to meet you, Mr. Crane. Pleased to meet you, young lady. I see that Miss Adams' benevolence is providing well for you. I would say rather that Nellie's mending skills provide well for us, Richard. Nellie and I have been great friends since she lived across the street about three years back. Isn't that right, Nellie? Yes, ma'am. I so appreciate that you managed to find time to help us out, Nellie, with all you do. Excuse me, Richard. I need to get my purse. My brother George used to work at Crane Brass and Bell Foundry. Ah, oh, very good. What did he do for us? He was a molder, but he's not working anymore. Here you are, Nellie, dear. We have so much excitement today that I almost forgot you were coming. Tell me, Nellie, have you been to the fair? No, but it's all the talk at the laundry. All the girls are dying to go. What if I asked you to go to the fair and report back to me about it and take a ride on that big new wheel? What do they call it? The Chicago Wheel. Quite an engineering feat by my associate, George Ferris. Although some say that it is not a suitable ride for ladies, considering their skirts and the wind. <laughs> it must be quite a view. Nellie, I think you should take Jean with you. It's safer, and it would be a lot more fun, wouldn't it? Yes, ma'am, if we can both get the day off. Let's see. This should cover two streetcar fares, entrance tickets for two, two rides on the wheel, and a little extra. Oh, thank you, Aunt uh, Miss Adams. <laughs> the buttonholes are all repaired, and the blouses are folded in the bottom of the basket. I'll be going now. It was a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Crane. Your generosity is remarkable. It's no wonder my wife calls you St. Jane. <laughs> oh, Richard, you're too kind. Jean, look here. Fifty cents each to get in, fifty cents each for our rides on the big wheel, and fifty cents each for our little extra. Gee, sis, how many times are you going to count those coins? I'm going to squeeze them till the eagles grin. Three dollars. That's more than I make in a week. Sister, you is the best of the bestest. Tickies to the fair. <laughs> Aunt Jane treats us better than Ma. Once Miss Smith told me she and Aunt Jane think of me like their daughter. Two spinsters having a kid. <laughs> That's a laugh. But why is your Aunt Jane so stingy? That ain't half enough for a porterhouse steak dinners. <laughs> Speaking of dinner, what'd you pack in this bag, Jean? It feels heavy. The usual. Onion sandwiches, boiled potatoes, carrots, a sliced tomato, lettuce, all extras from the guys at work. They call it my tip for playing the mouth organ when we're packing up after work. You deserve that and more. You even play the Italian street songs. They sing along at the top of their lungs. Funiculi, funicula, funi <laughs> No wonder this is heavy. You brought our drinking glasses. What for? For the new water fountain? The water's good. No typhoid at our fair, no sir. But they passed the glasses around, and when I heard that, I said, No, mister, we're gonna drink from our own glasses. This will be a lunch to remember. I'm hungry and thirsty just thinking about it. Just like Oliver Twist. Remember when he used to read it to us? Remember? Please, Please sir, I, I want, want some more. more. <laughs> <laughs> remember how much George loved that book? 
But Pa made sure to ruin everything for us. Even reading. Like I told Aunt Jane. I am forgetting how to read. I used to love reading about heroes and kings and Longfellow's poems. I'd read them by the hour, but now I've gone straight to hell. Chicago. You've got some Sarah Bernhardt in ya. A book takes so long, I'd rather sing a song, and books are very costly, you know. Besides those moving pictures, tell the story quicker. So it's off to the arcade she loves to go. Oh! I am forgetting how to think. I used to have free time and tea time and friends. I'd sit in the garden and I'd ponder everything. But now I've gone straight to hell in Chicago. She's gone straight to hell in Chicago. Tell me who can think with their arms deep in a sink of scalding water half the day. Can I be thinking when the open sewer's stinking? And the bed bugs always have their way. Nowadays I cannot talk or think or read or write or walk like a lady anymore. I'll tell you one and all, it's a devil of a fall when you've gone straight to hell in Chicago. She's gone straight to hell in Chicago. Me? I'm just glad to trade in them mops, ropes, and buckets for a day. What'd you tell the boss? Told him my uncle croaked and I was a pallbearer. Let's hope he doesn't check the obits. He won't. He knows us lowlifes don't make the papers unless we're hauled off to jail or jump in front of a train. Then we make the front page. Complete with bloody pictures. Well, I hope you don't see him here today. Nah, he's too busy cheating us on our pay. That takes time, you know. But Ma thinks I'm at work. And to think she still blames you for chasing Pa away. You saved her skin, too. Wish I'd sent him on a one-way trip to Kingdom Come. Even though the brick only scraped him, he knows I got a good strong throwing arm. And next time I'll finish him off. After what he done to George. And what he did to you, too, Jean. Tried to crack me open like a walnut. <laughs> but luckily I'm too hard-headed. And you had some close calls too, Nellie. Thanks to you, and no thanks to Ma, you and George kept him away from me. Every day and every night. He chased you like a rabid dog. But you were a little too quick for the dirty devil. Just thinking of him makes me want to vomit. Miss Nellie, fleet of foot. Like that Diana statue over at the fair. <gasps> Look, it's the trolley. Come on, sis, forget of the troubles! World's Fair, here we come! <laughs> Look at it, Jean! It's the fair! This is our day! Another day just like it acres away. This is our day. This is our day. It belongs to us. No one can take it away. Oh, look at the flowers. Jean, look at this. A poster of little Egypt doing a belly dance. Get a load of this, boys! We got the seven wonders of the world! A moving sidewalk, electric lighting, the big wheel, a fountain spurting out clean water. And she's looking at a bed of flowers and staring at a poster. Jean, look! There's a vaudeville show here at six. Maybe we can buy tickets with our little extra. And look at the poster, Jean. They're high kickers. You know, I could match any one of those girls in a high-kicking contest. Or beat them. 
Can't you just see me in one of those big green skirts to match my hypnotic green eyes? That's our Nelly. She gotta be the star, even if it's only in her mind. You know I can, Jean. Oh, look! There's the vaudeville office, right by the dance hall. Jean, I'm going to go and get an audition. It's Nelly, the shrinking violet. Who could ever coax her out of her shell? Hello? I'd like to speak to the management. What's all the shouting about? Hello, mister. I'm the best high kicker in Chicago, and your vaudeville show needs me. I can kick a newspaper out of your hands when it's up over your head. It's true, mister. I should know. I'm her brother. Ah, is that so? So, what else can you do, young lady? Cartwheels, tap, the split, the cakewalk, the ragtime dance, you name it. That's what they all say, until they trip on their own feet. Jean, give us a quick tune. Here you go, sis. <laughs> See her dance. The kid's unnatural. Just see her dance. You'll see her capture all the hearts of the guys. Watch their surprise when her high kick touches the skies. See her prance. <laughs> She's a phenomenon. Just give her a chance. She'll be the rage up on that stage. Mister, look at her dance. It's very good. That's quite a kick she got there. But can she feel the house? You bet she can. In your troop, she'll be the star attraction, rules the coop. When she swings into action, shaking her hips, puckering her lips, her gyrations launch a thousand ships. Boys go weak as she kicks the money out of their hands. You'll pile up your dough when she's in your show. Just look at her dance. <sighs> well, <laughs> what do you think? <sighs> I tell you what, we got a traveling show with a spot open. One of the girls is home with the baby. We'll give you a try and see how you work out. Thanks, mister. By the way, we were planning to see the vaudeville show tonight, so could you throw in a couple of tickets? The young lady knows how to bargain. Sure, why not? I'll tell the house manager. Just go in the side door, show my card, and sit over by the side of the stage. Here's my card, young lady. When you come at six, I'll introduce you to my brother the director of the traveling show, and you can work it out. Look at this card. It says he's Saul Friedman of Friedman's Vaudeville Show. Gene, they're the ones who put on the shows at the Star and Garter. Sis, you could talk a zebra out of his stripes. And now we can use our little extra for something else. Maybe I can get a nice tortoiseshell hairpin. And now I can get one of them souvenir pennies to pass around at the saloon. Jean, I'm going to get this job. Go on the stage and go on the road before Ma drags me into her line of work. Testing out the beds at the Friendship Hotel ain't no line of work no how. But what do you want? We're the Wicked Wicks. Step right up, folks. Take a look. Right before your eyes. See the wicked wicks. Cracking jokes. And cracking skulls. Scrubbing floors. And washing whores' drawers. Telling tall tales. And sleeping in jails. We're the wicked wicks. Fools and misfits. Minstrels and wastrels. Our lives are the show. You'll take a look, then run like hell the other way. Thanking your stars, you ain't got what we got. And hoping you don't catch it. <laughs> Seriously, Jean. If I leave, what are you gonna do? 
Hell, my life's nothing to waste the tiniest teardrop on. I got my squeegee and the corner saloon. You've got a chance, sis. Get out and shake what God gave you right in the old Rip's face. Now where is that damn wheel? Behind those trees. It must be the wheel. Whew. They say you can see the blue lady real nice from up top. Ever since I came back in Chicago, I've wanted to sit and look at the lake. Maybe go on a picnic? This will be the first time. Miss Michigan's a moody lady. When she's calm, she's soft and blue as the sky. But when a front gets her stirred up, watch out! She gets all the way up to my scaffold and shakes me like a rag doll. <laughs> Jean, look! There's the women's building. You know, we ladies can be more than wives, mothers, scrub women, or trollops. We can be dancers, or open settlement houses like Aunt Jane. Or sew a buttonhole like you're mending a broken heart. Hey, sis, you must have worked up an appetite with that dancing. You'd better believe it. I nearly popped a button. Well, come on, sit down here, let's eat. <laughs> eat like you got some manners, Jean. I'd eat better with the man's beverage to wash it down. Ah, How about giving me that little extra? I can mosey over to that German beer garden. Jean, you're 14. A little pint never hurt nobody. Oh, really? Except for the scar on your head, Jean? And how about my burn marks? How about George? If I'm gonna work like a man, I'm gonna drink like one. One Wix with delirium trimmings is enough for one family. Come on, let's find that free water. You can even wash your hands in it. Okay, kid! <laughs> let's stroll like high society, catch a ride on the moving sidewalk, guzzle some clean water, then get up on that wheel and look down with pity on the poor suckers below. The fair, a free show, and best of all, a chance for me to be in vaudeville. This is our day. This is our day. This, this is our day. day. There, there ain't, ain't another, another day, day just like it anchors away. This is our day. This is our day. Without a care, we're at the fair. And this is our day. Miss High Kicker. Having a fun! Forget all the troubles! Time to tell Mary's parents that I will join them. Let's see. <clears throat> Dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith, how kind it is of you to invite me along on your wonderful journey to Europe and Egypt with your lovely daughter, Mary. It is true that the typhoid fever from which I have recently recovered has left me weakened and that, as you mentioned, this will be my first vacation since opening Hull House six years ago. But for the grace of Jane, I'd be out on the street. But for the grace of Jane, I'd have nothing to but eat. But for the grace of Jane, I'd never be alive. But for the grace of Jane, how could we have survived? For, for the, the grace of Jane, our own Saint Jane. Miss Adams, please. Oh, oh, you startled me. Caught up in listening to them girls singing about ya, I see. Oh, they're just practicing for a musical program. It's a song one of the girls wrote. Let's see if you're as good as all that. I'm Mrs. Wicks, and you may call me Adeline. And what may I do for you, Mrs. Wicks? It concerns my daughter, Nellie, whom you know her. Yes, we met when your family lived on Halstead Street. I believe it was the night your son Walter was born. Oh, yes, that night. 
little commotion, but everything came out fine in the end. Indeed. As I recall, I knitted a sweater for little Walter, and Miss Starr brought it over with a layette. I remember that sweater. Itchy. Our family line has sensitive skin. It's our English blood. Ah, uh, yes. It certainly wasn't the level to which you are accustomed. Now, what is your business, Mrs. Wicks? To get to the point, you do a lot of favors for Nellie, and being the show-off she is, she likes to brag about it. So I thought it was time I set you straight about her. How so, Mrs. Wicks? When she returned from her frolic as a dirty vaudeville dancer, you do know about that, don't you? She was penniless. The show went bust, and I took her in. Even got her a job at the hotel where I have a position. She met a boiler man, a German fellow, and a few months ago they married. I am aware of that. Well, he's locked up now. Three years for burglary. That ain't no way to start married life. Oh, <laughs> but you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? Well, I found someone for her. A real gentleman. Someone who fancies her. He just happens to be my boss. All she needs to do is accept his attentions. Mrs. Wicks, does Nellie have any say in the matter? Isn't it time her mother had some say? I kept her fed, clothed. She even got her own bed while the boys shared one. She ran off without so much as a goodbye and came crawling back with her dirty dancing days fell apart. She got hitched with that jailbird, and now just as soon as you can spit, she's back again. I want her out, once and for all. Lucky for her, I found just the man to make it happen. And what on earth do you want from me, Mrs. Wicks? Make Nell accept the boss's romancing. Once things take their course, she can divorce that German jailbird and marry the boss. He'll set her up good. And her poor old ma, too, by the way, he said so. He's got money, piles of it. And as the Bible says, a rising tide lifted all boats. Mrs. Wicks, you are trying to sell your daughter to your boss. I'll have no part of it. Nellie is a foolish girl. She laughs too much. She thinks she's a dancer. No end of trouble. Her father and me tried to knock some sense into her, but she's a bad seed. She's damaged goods already. I expect my family to be respectable. And Nellie comes up short. Mrs. Wicks, you must think I do not know what Nellie has endured at your hands, or that I have some partiality toward you as her mother. Such is not the case. Leave the premises immediately. Think you're a real lady, do you now? I know what you are, Miss Jane Adams. You hide behind your shawls and skirts, but you're the one who has fallen outside good society with your Mary Smith hanging on you. You ain't one mite respectable. Respectable is as respectable does, Mrs. Wicks. Now get out before I have you removed. I'm glad to leave. And as for that sweater... Walter puked all over it, and we threw it out. Cheap wool from a cheap lady. <sighs> Dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I'm honored to be considered part of your family. I gratefully accept your invitation. Faithfully yours, Jane Adams. I believe, finally, that the teacher is engaged not simply in the training of individuals, but in the formation of the proper social life. I believe that every teacher should realize the dignity of his calling, 
that in this way the teacher always is the prophet of the true God and the usherer in of the true kingdom of God. Thank you for the lecture, Mr. Dewey. Bravo, Professor Dewey. John, that was wonderful. What a fine group of working men and women we had tonight. It's gratifying to see so many turn up, even on a cold winter night after a long day's work. A most enthusiastic audience, Jane. It's not hard to get a good turnout for Dr. John Dewey. Let's do it again very soon, John. Perhaps a series. Our residents enjoy considering new ideas. And you are making waves with your laboratory school, not only in Chicago, but in the entire nation. Waves? You, Jane, are a one-woman tidal wave. Imagine, garbage inspector for the 19th Ward, the first woman in Chicago history, perhaps American history, to take on the trash. <laughs> you know I enjoy a challenge. The 19th Ward has many challenges, as you call them, yet you willingly place yourself right in the middle of the hubbub. The alderman was not giving our neighborhood the needed attention, so I had to step forward. But garbage collection? <laughs> Mary and her parents encouraged me to try, quite unlike my stepmother, I might add, who is appalled by my mixing with the dirt, as she calls it. I'm proud to wear the Commissioner's Star, as you can see here on my lapel. Ah, yes, I see. It's lovely. Oh, Julia, what's the problem? Jane, the social science club's raising a ruckus. No one shows any sign of leaving. Shall we... Oh, Professor Dewey, we're sorry you had to deliver your lecture right next door to our noisiest, most vociferous club. It must have been quite distracting. Not in the least, Julia. It stimulated me to speak a little louder and with more animation. <laughs> I will have to attend their meetings to find out what is really going on in Chicago, outside our stuffy university. <laughs> Nonsense, John. You are quite visionary. We are spellbound by you. Jane, shall I disperse them? It's well past ten, and Ellen is trying to sleep. If they are merely animated, but not angry, I suggest letting things run their course. The Play-Doh Club doesn't start until 9 a.m., so Ellen will have plenty of time to sleep. But if the tone is turning angry, call me in for a stern look. All right, Jane, I'll do my best. Nice to see you, Professor Dewey. A haven and a hotbed. You manage to have both. But there is other news, isn't there? You have been to Europe, Egypt, and to Russia since I last saw you, visiting our friend in the painting up there, Count Tolstoy. Did he help you count your blessings, or was he instead a count of no account? <laughs> a bit of both, John. After giving his books to so many young people, I felt it was high time I met Tolstoy in person. We endured bumpy carriages, lurching trains, and inclement weather. It was a long journey, and you know I'm not blessed with a sturdy constitution. Jane, my dear, that you do all that you do is completely miraculous. We arrived at the Count's farm in the evening. They sent news of our arrival, and Mary and I passed a long night in his rustic guest house with only a single candle. He met with us the following day. Hmm, ladies in waiting, eh? The sun sets early in Russia. When we finally met, alas, John, it did not go well. He expressed contempt for my dress. Your dress? What could be wrong with your dress? Perhaps he had a touch of food poisoning, the vapors, or dyspepsia? In fact, he said, I could make an entire dress from the fabric in merely one of the sleeves of your dress. An aristocratic boar, posing as a peasant. And he seemed to have forgotten I was traveling with a companion, and did not ask Mary's name, nor acknowledge her in any way. How utterly rude. Yes, but he was a wonderful man. Oh, surely. Yes, surely. <laughs> On a farm called Yasnaya Polyana. Wearing a rough woven shirt 
lives a noble born Count Leo Tolstoy, and he's up to his elbows in dirt. He believes that our work will redeem us. We must live by the sweat of our brow. And when visitors visit and ask him how is it, he's only too glad to tell how. And how. Oh, how, how we admire Count Tolstoy and, and the way he communes with the land. Though he only eats porridge, he's never discouraged. He's, he's a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. Such, such a wonderful, wonderful man. When I came to Yasnaya Polyana, from a journey of several days, I was full of emotion and humble devotion to learn of this modern saint's ways. You can trust I was not disappointed that he had but one hour to spare. For his work so important, I would not have shortened it. I was just glad to be there. Oh, oh how, how we admire, admire Count Tolstoy. His novels. His essays. His plans. Such plans. Though he didn't like me too much. One must agree he's such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. man. Such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. man. He supports non-resistance to evil And opposes conscription to war He's a strict vegetarian Anti-sectarian, in fact There's, there's not, not much that he's for If we only could live like Count Tolstoy Think how our lives would be simple be and pure, pure. We would not own our houses. We'd cut up our blouses and give all the sleeves to the poor. Are you sure? Oh, oh how, how we admire, admire Count Tolstoy, whose bread is made by his own hand. hand. But, but he's, he's so full, full of perfect love. love. Most folks aren't, aren't good enough for this wonderful, wonderful man. He so loves humanity, it's people he can't stand. For he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Such a wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> Jane, does this place never settle down? Doorbells ringing, debates raging. When do you rest? John, this is exactly what life should be about. Oh, Aunt Nelly. Pardon me, John here is a young friend. You must excuse me. Of course, I will be on my way. And I gather that you have more excitement ahead. Good evening, miss. Goodbye, dear Jane. Aunt Jane, my only friend. My dearest angel, I need you now. Nellie, dear, you look frozen to the bone. Where have you been these past months? I lost track of you shortly after you and Mr. Themy married. I have been worried. I've been to hell and back, Aunt Jane. How did you come here at this hour? Where have you been? Put down your basket. You look ghastly. Please sit, dear. I came on the streetcar. I'm alone in this world, Aunt Jane. You're my only friend. Nellie, you know that I have stood by you in the tempest, but it is hard to help you when I have no idea where you are. It has been nearly a year. And Jane, I knew that if I told you where I was, you couldn't manage to lie to my mother if she came looking for me. I was living, or better to say, hiding, at a room at Mrs. Martin's. Your landlady, when you married Mr. Themy? Yes, when Rudy was sent to prison. I guess you heard about that. I had to move back with Ma, again, and she dragged me to work at her hotel. She kept bringing her boss around to stare at me and pester me. She pushed him on me. I hated him. But he was her boss. My dear girl. He had his way in the end. Once I realized that I was in the family way, I moved out without telling her and went back to Mrs. Martin's, alone. 
She let me move into a spare room in exchange for cleaning and mending. I see. Mrs. Martin didn't even notice my condition. Her eyes are clouded over. She can barely see. So long as I mended her clothes and stitched her buttonholes, she had no complaints. And I ate what I could take out of her pantry. I usually went to bed hungry. Oh, my. How long did this continue? Five long months. When I could no longer sleep through the night, I told her I wanted to visit my mother, and I went to county and checked myself in. They kept me in confinement for three weeks. They took good care of me, and nobody asked any nosy questions. The maternity floor was full of women. Black women, white women, immigrant girls. All of us alone, poor and in crisis. I thought about what you do, Aunt Jane, and I helped feed and wash the new babies. I even gave a couple of newborns my breast. It sounds like a sanctuary for women and girls. It was. At least for poor girls like me, Aunt Jane. But when my time finally came, after hours of agony, the baby came out crooked and tore me near to pieces. Childbirth is dangerous, even in a hospital. How absolutely horrible, Nellie. They let me stay another week with the baby. I named her Ethel. Until my wounds started to heal. Then I had no choice but to take her back to Mrs. Martin's, where I had my clothes and blankets. You should have come here, Nellie. I was afraid Ma and her boss would come here looking for me. Yes, she came by here some time back, asking if I knew where you were. I assure you I wouldn't have told her, even if I knew. When Mrs. Martin saw Ethel, she called me terrible names and locked me out. I sobbed and begged and made a scene. She finally let me in, but started to make the sign of the cross every time she saw me. For a nice Christian lady, she wasn't very Christian. But that's nothing new to me. Did your mother find you there? No, she never did. But Mrs. Martin made me work even harder. For one dollar a week. The room had no fireplace, and I had nothing but table scraps to eat. I tried to nurse Ethel, but my milk was no good, thin and blue. I got sick, and so did Ethel. <laughs> oh, my heavens. This evening, at three months old to the day, Ethel joined Graham and the other angels. Oh. Dear, how tragic. Mrs. Martin heard me sobbing and told me to call the coroner to take Ethel away. I cried, no, let her rest in heavenly peace, not tossed into a pauper's grave in Potter's Field. So I rushed out the door and brought her here. In the basket? Oh, dear, poor little thing. But why here? Aunt Jane, I want Ethel to rest with the saints and the angels, not tossed in a pauper's grave. I beg you, please give my Ethel a proper burial. Oh, I, I suppose I can arrange that. Of course we can arrange that, in your family plot. Fact is, we don't have a plot. But I'd be ever so grateful, Aunt Jane. <laughs> Dear, I will take care of things in the morning. Jane, now they are arguing. I think it might come to blows. You need to... Oh, Nellie? What are you doing here at this hour of the night? She has had a tragic event, Julia. She has lost a baby. Oh, Nellie. We didn't know. Oh, dear. Why? Why do women and children always come last in this world? I don't know the answer to that, Miss Lathrop. But Jesus knows I loved my baby. Julia, I have told Nellie I will arrange a final resting place for her angel. Poor dear. Nellie, can't you stay and rest a bit? Can we fix you some supper? Mrs. Martin will be looking for me tomorrow at 7 a.m., right after her morning prayers. So I have to go back. Dear, I will take tender care of Ethel. Ethel, my angel, I give you to my angel on earth. Nellie, I will bring her upstairs to my room and then prepare some food for you. And let me get you some money. You must buy some liver from the butcher tomorrow. You'll need to get back your strength. Julia, the social science enthusiasts will have to control themselves. I cannot come. Nellie is more important. Yes, she is. If they will not control themselves, I will make them leave. Yes, 
women and children first. Well, Ellen and Julia, here we are again, two days to Christmas, and here is a parcel. Let's see what Mrs. High Society Haldeman Adams, I mean, mother, has sent me for Christmas. <laughs> what do you guess? Could it be yet another embroidered tea, Cozy? No, the package is too small. Is it a lace ruffle? I am about to faint from the excitement. Let's see. Oh! Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. It's another handkerchief! <laughs> oh. And my poor niece has undoubtedly been forced to squint over it instead of enjoying the books I send. Poor girl. I'm going to write the thank you note right away before cynicism overpowers me. What on earth shall I write? Tell her your nose is exceedingly grateful for the gift. Ooh, tell her it's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. December 22, 1903, Hull House. My dear mother, may I thank you for the handkerchief which came this morning. Isn't it very cheering to have a home greeting in the midst of the Christmas rush? Honestly, a Christmas hanky. Does she think your nose is dripping? Out, out, damn spot. You need to wipe yourself clean, Jane. <laughs> to her, Halstead Street is filthy. Hull House is filthy. Chicago is filthy. Is that why she never visits? She did not visit for the first three years, as you know. The first time she came was during the Columbian Exposition, with the pretext that she was chaperoning my niece. It was the fair she wanted to see, not Hull House. And I might add that despite her endowment, as you know, she has never contributed a single penny of donation. Maybe the handkerchief is the donation. Oh, can you imagine? She thought it was splendid when you and I went to Europe after seminary. Yes, Ellen. She believed we were finishing our training to become respectable wives with prominent husbands, not future organizers of a news-making settlement house. A world-famous settlement house? But I suppose she didn't thrill to the idea that her daughter would become the first woman garbage commissioner. She wanted to make you a fine Victorian lady. She always has been an aspirant to all things elegant. Like all of our mothers. All that training in table manners. Remember this? If children are carefully taught to hold utensils properly and use them well so nothing falls or slips. If children are carefully taught to place the napkin skillfully and eat without the slightest sound of the lips. If children are carefully taught to drink from glasses silently and fully masticate the food at hand. If children are carefully taught, they will always be at ease at the grandest tables in the land. La 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> Surely you remember the rules for the table. Drink sparingly when eating. It's better for digestion. Drink sparingly when eating. Much better for digestion. And when you start to drink, do it easily and gently. And do not pour the liquid down.
down your throat. Do you know it? You must not pour the liquid down your throat. You must not talk loudly or boisterously at table. Never speak too loudly or boisterously at table. Be cheerful and companionable and chat as you are able. But do not monopolize the talk. You're a lady. You must not monopolize the talk. When a course is finished, if knife and fork are used, when a course is finished, if a knife and fork are used, in the middle of the plate, you must lay them side by side, not crossed with the handles facing right. That's right, uncrossed with the handles facing right. And the dreadful pamphlet given to men. She read it to my stepbrother piously as if it contained Bible verses. We had to suppress our giggles. It went something like this. Don't seat yourself until the ladies have sat down. Never bend your head for a mouth full of soup. Don't balance peas on your knife like a clown. A fork is not a pitchfork. A spoon is not a scoop. Don't make chomping noises when you are chewing. Never try to speak with food in your mouth. Don't gulp a beverage. Be alert to what you're doing. Keep your napkin on your lap. Please do not let it go south. Don't wipe perspiration from your face with a napkin. Never spit seeds or gristle on the floor. Don't stand up mid-meal, no matter what may happen. Well-dressed, well-washed, well-groomed is what ladies all adore. from the court of Queen Victoria. A little less proper and a great deal busier. Let's hear it for the modern working woman. Hip, hip, hip hooray! It's me, Nellie. Well, now you know about some very terrible times, which I do not like to talk about. I had three children, another one with that terrible boss who Ma forced me to marry, and then two with a man I loved and then married, Rudy Themy. But a couple of months after our marriage, he was arrested and thrown in jail. So I was alone, with three kids, working every day, as wrung out as a dirty dish rag. For the love of God, who's doing that banging at my door? We are looking for Mrs. Nellie Themy. We are from Juvenile Protection. She don't live here. Mrs. Themy, this is our third visit to your home. We'd like to talk to you. Please let us in. Why don't you damn creeps leave me alone? Mrs. Themy, we would like to talk to you about your children. Don't you worry about my children. Perhaps you do not know that I bring all three of my beloved babies over to the Crane Day Nursery at Hull House at the crack of dawn six days a week. We are concerned about the little... Tell it to Jane Adams, my best friend. She thinks I'm doing a great job. Go away. That is surely true, but we would like to talk to you about their health and your living conditions. Please allow us to come in. Trying to take my kids away to the house of Good Shepherd, is it? Over my dead body. 
You get away from my door, or I'll tell Miss Adams, and she ain't gonna like it. What the hell are you doing here, pestering my sister? Get away from here, or I'll paste you one, ladies or not. Scram! We are here by order of the county, because- Do you understand the word scram, or do I have to imprint it on your chins with my fist? Get out of here. Scram! <sighs> Mrs. Seamy, we'll return at a later time. Hey, sis, let me in. They're gone. <laughs> at a trot. Uh, Jean, just in time. Leave those wet buckets by the door. How did you know they were here? Just lucky. Your neighbor down the hall, the little baker, Al, is it? Was standing outside smoking his corncob pipe and he saw me coming home from work. He called me over and said, you might need help. Oh, that little shrimp. Well, you sure showed him. That nosy lady in the front apartment, with her high and mighty airs, thinks that just because she's got a man, mine's in jail, I'm a no-good mother. I know what a good mother looks like, because it's exactly what we never had. They're cute as buttons, them three kids. I never hit them, never cuss them out. I feed them before I even take a bite. In fact, I'm just about to go pick them up from the nursery, just rest in my sore dogs. If only that jailbird were out and bringing home the bacon, maybe I could be the mother I want to be. Play with them. Read to them. Take them to the park. Sis, you know as good as me, Rudy ain't in jail no more. He left you, and that's all there is to it. The walls of this joint are crawling with bugs. The kids are sleeping on two chairs pushed together and sick half the time, and you're dragging your laundry basket around, looking like something out of the crypt. Ain't it about time you went after that lousy jailbird for support? Rudy is gonna come back, Gene. You'll see. Yeah, him in the second coming. Why don't you listen to them ladies at Hull House? Instead of chasing away juvie protection, why don't you haul his sorry carcass into court for non-payment of support? I bailed him out three times. I sent him all the money Ma's creepy boss kept showering on me. I gave him two beautiful kids that looked like him, and a smart one, too. What more could a man want? And not a nickel for coal or groceries. He's got a job. And that money is going somewhere, Nell. You know he's still the boiler man over at the hotel. I haven't seen him. You've seen him? Then I'll go down and file for abandonment. Like the ladies keep saying I should. And we'll see if the worm turns. That's right. See what that judge can shake out of his piggy bank. Jane, our visit this evening was so inspiring. The crane nursery looks better than ever. All those fine wooden high chairs and the new kitchen floor. Oh, yes, Julia. Our volunteers are miracle workers. Some of them attend my Play-Doh club in the mornings, too. It's amazing that they find the time. Yes, Ellen, you certainly have a loyal crew. Oh, I so enjoy these visits. I wish I could visit the children more often although I don't read nearly as well as the women from the kindergarten college. Yes, the women are faithful, and they bring books to the library every week. The children loved your reading, Jane. Their little faces looked at you with such fondness. You held their rapt attention. That's what Mary always says, but I'm sure I have a tuneless speaking voice. I've told you for years that the children loved you, Jane. Yes, of course, Ellen. I, I simply recall that Mary said it recently when we were in Bar Harbor. Of course, Jane. You traveled together, so there's so much more contact. She is my right arm. Of course, you are both my... Left arms? I'd just as soon be your right arm, brandishing an umbrella. Like that night we first met Nellie and saved her baby brother. And I'm content to be the pen you hold when you're explaining what on earth a settlement house does for all those fine ladies' magazines. Whatever limbs you are, I couldn't manage without either of you. 
But speaking of contact, Ellen, how is the new Bohemian family on Polk Street that you visited yesterday? The two girls are already speaking English better than their mother. I've told her about the English classes, and I think she'll join them. But, like our other immigrant children, the children are sponges for new languages. I wish I had their talent, but it's no wonder. Some of the children spend more time in the nursery than they do at home. After all, it offers not only English, but heat, light, and bathtubs. Oh, thank goodness for Mr. Crane's gift. What a lasting legacy to his dear wife. And it's such a cheerful place. The nursery attracts so many volunteers, visitors, and donations. I do wish, however, that some of those fine ladies would stop clucking about our hard-working single mothers. Especially considering that some of them face the same problems with their own husbands. Battering, bigamy, alcoholism, even abandonment. They just know how to cover it up better. Or they take the miscreant to court. <laughs> Speaking of clucking, Jane... The fine ladies at today's luncheon did not seem to appreciate your remarks about helping girls who make their living off the street. It seemed they'd like to send you back to Cedarville, on a rail. I'm afraid my stepmother would agree. Imagine a 45-year-old woman speaking up for poor girls and women in trouble and never married to a man. That is surely no way for a lady to behave. Indeed, they say... Why don't you be a lady, Lady Jane? You're from a lovely family, it's a shame. You could have become a mother, isn't it plain? Your sacrifice is nobody's gain. Well, for a while you had something going. And your support was growing. You, you even took urchins off the street. But now your behavior's far-fetched. You even collect the garbage. Catholic and Jew. Anarchist, too. You've, You've got, got a motley crew. Why be don't you be a lady, Lady Jane? Jane. Seeing oh, you in this squalor brings me pain. pain. You should have become a mother. Be Isn't it plain? Your sacrifice is nobody's, nobody's gain. Once you said grace at table, now it's a different label. You even take girls who live, live in sin. You fraternize with the hired hand and every union firebrand. The neighborhood's rough, the kids are too tough. Haven't you had enough? Why don't you be a lady, Lady Jane? You're from a lovely family, it's a shame. You could have become a mother, isn't it plain? Your sacrifice is nobody's gain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, fine ladies. Say, Ellen, is that the late edition you're holding? Yes, I got it from that little Russian newsboy on the corner. Does that poor boy ever go home? Jacob taught himself English by reading the papers he sells, and it's his third language after Russian and Yiddish. Like Benny, our clarinet prodigy. Oh, I'm glad we were able to find Benny that clarinet. That boy is going places. Is Jacob still out there, or has he packed up for the night, I wonder? His mother didn't show up this week to demonstrate a spinning wheel for the Labor Museum. Let me go ask him how she's doing. Finally, time to read the late edition. Oh my, this is not what I expected to see on the front page. Not another child run over by one of those terrible automobiles, I hope. It's our Nelly. Of course. Wasn't today her day in court asking for child support from Mr. Themy? Yes, it's all about that. What does it say? When she came before the judge, there was a rustle from the courtroom, and a young German girl approached the bench with an infant son in her arms. So it's worse than abandonment. He's a bigamist. 
Well, Jacob was still there, and I learned that Manya, his mother, has not been coming to Hull House because she was diagnosed with TB. We must prepare a basket for her. The sanatorium is so desolate. What are you looking at? It's Arnelli at her trial today. It seems there is an unexpected appearance by a young German girl accusing Themi of paternity with a baby almost the same age as Nellie's. There's even a picture. Oh, dear, a photo in the paper? She'll be devastated. The trial was supposed to win her some support. Let's see. Here's Judge Healy passing the hat around the courtroom from Nellie and the German girl. I guess he didn't know where to start between the two women. It looks like those are the only funds she'll receive. Oh, dear. Nellie hoped that when Mr. Themy saw the children in court, he'd be charmed by them, and the family would be made whole. Of course, once a man has to be dragged into court, it's too late for that. I suspect today Nellie's bubble of illusion has finally burst. Nellie, I'm glad you've come to visit. I was glad to hear that you have married Mr. Dewar and put that awful trial behind you. I sure hate to keep coming to you for money, Aunt Jane. It's shameful to me. But we can't live on what Al makes, and I tell him that every day. Nellie, perhaps it would be easier if you tried to get along with your new husband and to treat him as if you liked him for himself. I don't like Al for himself. I hate him. Besides, he hits me. I have never heard you say such a thing before. When did he hit you, Nellie? Well, I hit him first, but he deserved it. I broke a plate over Al's head the day after we got married, right after he announced he was quitting his bakery job. And then he swiped me back. Not the best honeymoon, I imagine. But Mr. Dewar has a new bakery job in Englewood now. Isn't that right? And I don't believe he is a violent man. Not violent, but he's stingy. He gives me an allowance and spends the rest playing cards with the other bakers, while our stomachs growl at home. Before you married, when he was a boarder living down the hall from you, isn't it true that he helped you out? A Danish. Sometimes a strudel for the kids. But that doesn't mean I ever looked at him as a man. Don't you think he thinks a great deal of you to take in three children not his own, Nellie? Maybe. He gives them rolls and lets them knead the bread with him. <laughs> it's comical. They get all dusty with flour. Ah, so he's teaching them to bake. All they can do at this point is punch the dough. They sure like what he bakes, though. They call him Pop, and little Marlo brings him his slippers when he comes home. But I can't bring myself to love him. Couldn't you just treat him in a kind of friendly way? He's just a little squirt. No prize there, Aunt Jane. Al's not my idea of a... Let's just say he ain't Rudy. But that's water under the bridge. I understand that Mr. Themy is the father of two of your children. But between his incarcerations, his abandonment of the family... And the discovery at the trial. Oh, don't you worry. I wouldn't take Rudy back again if he was served up on a silver platter, smothered in thousand-dollar bills. Nellie, Miss Smith and I have been talking, and we have an idea. What if we found a new, bigger place for you and Mr. Dewar? You could call it a belated wedding gift. What if we furnished it for you with second-hand furniture and dishes and rugs in a better neighborhood, in Englewood, near Mr. Dewar's new job, and paid the first month's rent so that you could get a new start on things? Our own apartment? In Englewood? Would it have a garden with grass and trees? Maybe inside plumbing? Yes, we will make sure it has all those things. Bad as things may seem at times... You are giving your children a much better life than you had with your mother and the rest of the Wicks, and I'd like to help out. And with flowers, uh, that we could see when we look out the window? <laughs> yes, Nellie, <laughs> we will find flowers. 
Mr. Dewar cares about you and your children, and you will all benefit from a new start. I can't find the words no more, Aunt Jane. You saved baby Walter when Wicks was beating us. You buried my Ethel when I was all alone, and you didn't judge. You took my babies into the nursery so I could work and not worry about them. And I'm still here, thanks to a little bit of luck, but mostly thanks to you. No need to thank me, Nellie. And now you're telling me you will find a new place for my family with furniture and flowers? I don't go to church because they don't need another hypocrite. But I believe in you. And I believe in you, Nellie. Your spirit is unquenchable. Aunt Jane, I just can't help acting up, whether it's high-kicking, hollering, or husbands. Yes, Nellie, you, we, are high-spirited. But I'll try my best to act like I got feelings for Al, even though the little shrimp repulses me. Maybe you could teach him to dance. That's what we girls love best. <laughs> I will, for the grace of Jane. I'd be out on the street But for the grace of Jane I'd have nothing to but eat But for the grace of Jane I'd never be alive But for the grace of Jane How could we have survived? For, for the, the grace of Jane, Jane Our own Saint Jane But for the grace of Jane I'd still be black and blue But for the grace of Jane I'd have nothing to do for, for the, the grace, grace of Jane, Jane for, for the, the grace of Jane, our own Saint Jane. Jane. For the grace of Jane, the homeless would be lost. For, for the, the grace, grace of Jane. Jane, but for the grace of Jane, like ships in tempest tossed. For the grace of Jane. For the St. Jane and the Wicked Wicks, written, composed, and produced by Kristen Lems, directed by Douglas Post, music direction by Diana Lawrence, piano arrangements and performance by Tom Cortese, mixed and edited by Dan Dietrich, Rebecca Keishan as Nellie Wicks, Evelyn, and additional vocal parts, Kathy Cowan as Jane Adams, and additional vocal parts, Monica Zaflick as Ellen Gates Star, second juvenile protection woman, and additional vocal parts, Maddie Sachs as Julia Lathrop, first juvenile protection woman, and additional vocal parts. Patrick Burns as George Wicks, John Dewey, narrator, and additional vocal parts. Therese Harold as Addie Wicks. Frankie Leo Bennett as George Wicks, and additional vocal parts. John B. Lean as Jim Wicks, Saul Friedman, and additional vocal parts. And Kingsley Day as Richard Crane.